Hey, welcome back to the season finale of Sage May Speaks. Guys, it has been such an amazing wild ride. Thank you so much for being on it with me. I knew I needed to bring it for the last episode of season one. Today, I'll be talking with an award-winning casting director in LA. She casts film, theater, voiceover, and television. One of her credits includes freaking Seinfeld, but she mainly lives in commercials, having cast well over a hundred of them, including, but not at all limited to, Snickers, Pizza Hut, Barbie, Ford, and so many more. She's also an amazing coach. Oh my gosh, I attended her five week workshop last summer and it kept me going through quarantine. She may actually be the woman responsible for my commercial acting skills. She's truly lovely and she wants all actors to succeed. Plus, she has some pretty amazing casting stories. Please welcome Terry Berland from Berland Casting. Thank you so much for being here, Terry. I'm so excited. It's my pleasure. I'm really <laughs> happy to be here too. Aww. So how has it been for you as a casting director during COVID? It's actually surprisingly been very busy. Different, but things are still happening. Yeah, I heard that commercials were like the first thing to come back when everything was shut down. Yes, it's very interesting because as soon as we had to move out of the office and I was working from home, so I had the TV on and it took about three days. And I noticed that they were using existing spots and they started changing the voiceover on those existing spots. And then I would say within seven days, directors, of course, were very, creative and all of a sudden there were new spots on spots that were of course recorded shot you know from their home in a very very creative way and then within two weeks it was much more polished and they had it figured out for people to cast and then shoot people in their own homes they would send the equipment to the actors homes whether it be phones or sometimes cameras. I was actually very moved and very proud of our industry on how creative they were. I mean, I always knew they were creative, but you know, they really put creativity into work. That stuff is so cool. In like the height of it, when I was with my parents still, and it was the craziness that it still is, but <laughs> I'd tell my parents that like some commercials were in people's homes. They wouldn't believe me. So <laughs> it's, well, it's crazy. Like, I mean, hard to believe. <laughs> so what was it? They would deliver the cameras and then like have the director on Zoom or something? In the beginning, they would either deliver an iPhone or two tripods and then they would there were certain specifications you know put in place where the actors could not open the box or touch the box for two full days and then they would guide them via Zoom or FaceTime on what to do and how to set it up in the very beginning i had this couple on actually in IG Live, and I interviewed them because they were one of the first to be part of a shoot like this. And it was a lot of extra work for the talent. And in the very, very beginning, no one knew what was up or down or everything was turned upside down. So the agents weren't asking for additional money for the talent. And then they did start asking for additional money and they did get it because the talent you know, they had to put markers on the floor and they had to be walked through rehearsals to make sure the lighting in the space was okay. And maybe they'd have to change pictures or put tape over, hide certain product names. There was a lot of extra work that the talent had to do in addition to setting up the equipment. I also heard that it's like not even you auditioning. It's like also your house. You had to send pictures of your house, which is crazy. Yeah. When you auditioned, you would show your house. <laughs> so weird. And 
this one particular shoot with this couple, it was took place in their kitchen and their family dining room. They have they have a kid, a baby. The talent would have to be on the phone with a wardrobe person and with a set designer. They had like hour meetings with three extra people. And one of them was the set design. So they'd have to, you know, take their iPhone, show the lighting, the natural lighting and what their countertops look like. And during this shoot, their countertop was too neat. It looked sterile, like there was nothing out of place. So one of the things that production set design had to tell them, um, move that around a little bit, mess that up a little bit <laughs> so it looks more lived in. That's so funny. I love yes, that. Yes, the talent had to decide how messy do they want their home? And it was never really acceptable to have laundry like flowing out of <laughs> laundry bins and things like that, or things, you know, hanging out of drawers. But it, the space did have to look like it was lived in. It's so interesting. <laughs> so I want to know how you got into casting. Oh. Oh, fancy. Oh, I got into <laughs> casting. I was living in New York City. I was young. It was one of my first jobs. And at that time, ad agencies had casting departments on Madison Avenue. And the actors would walk up and down Madison Avenue and go from one ad agency casting department to the next. <laughs> I know, stop at coffee shops in between with their actor friends. So I got a job at an ad agency in a casting department as a little assistant. And because it wasn't freelance, someone could not throw you a job and you could say, oh, I'm a casting director. <laughs> you know, you actually had to work your way up the ladder. I had to leave certain ad agencies to go to another one to get a promotion to my next level until um, I did, you know, graduate from an assistant to a casting director. And then I really ended up being the head of casting for BBDO, which was the third largest agency in the world at the time. So that was a really big position. So how did Verland casting become a thing? So then throughout the years, they started because of budgets First, they took casting away from the ad agency budget, and it was changed to production companies. And then the next step was ad agencies started dissolving their casting departments, disbanding them. And then ad agencies started creating their own production companies. So BPDO put me in my department in the production company. So we were basically freelance to the to their clients. And then that they started dissolving that too. And it was time for me to make a big life change. And I love the West. All my vacations I would spend out West. And I had many, many friends in Los Angeles. And I said, well, I'm going to try living in Los Angeles because I could work as a casting director there. So I was very fortunate because at the time, another casting department in Los Angeles knew that this was happening through, you know, it's all relationships. So through actually an agent, they wanted, they were a theatrical casting company, um, their name was Lieberman Hirschfeld at the time. And they were casting Wonder Years and ended up casting Seinfeld, Larry Sanders, Grace Under Fire. And they heard that I was moving out to Los Angeles. So we had meetings and long story short, I ended up partnering with them. So I had the commercial division of Lieberman Hirschfeld. That was very, very, very exciting because they were casting Seinfeld at the time. Yeah, that's so exciting. It was really, really exciting. And they trusted me. So during those couple of years, people were flying back and forth. It was really easy to fly from 
LA to New York and actors would come out for a few weeks, a few months, go back, um, basically work on both coasts. So I was very into knowing who was really great at comedy in New York. So when a New York comedy talent would come to LA and I would just say to my partners, hey, so-and-so is coming out here. And a lot of them got, ended up getting, um, you know, supporting roles on Seinfeld. So that was very exciting for everyone. That is very exciting for everyone. Wow, that's one of my favorite shows. It was brilliant, brilliantly written. But you know what the actors, one actor told me, he said, it was great for my resume, great for my ego, great for my career. He said, but you know what? Actually, when I'm in a commercial, it's like I'm the main person in the commercial. It's mine. But when I was on Seinfeld, I couldn't be funnier than any of them. I couldn't be as pretty as Julia Louis. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't be taller than... You know, so they said, actually, creatively, it was more creative for them to be the principal main hero role in a commercial than to be on that show. Yeah, on that show, it's Seinfeld's, not exactly. theirs. <laughs> well, you have the main ensemble, and then you have the guest stars. Not stars, not stars, guest people. <laughs> I totally yeah. know what you mean. So going off of that, actually... What makes you remember actors? That they're good actors. <laughs> you know, good actors stand out. There's nothing magical. There's no tricks. Easy to work with. You know, they audition well. They bring something special about themselves to the role. Of course, along with that, is they're easy to work with. They're on time. Professional. How can someone get on your radar as a casting director? You know, it just happens organically. You do, as an actor, you do your work. And when you're auditioning, even if we're not in the room, we see the auditions. So we get to know you when it's not COVID time. And I worked out of a studio, uh, Castaway Studios, where there are five other casting directors six casting studios. So when I would walk through the reception area, I it would be full of actors. And throughout the years, time and time again, seeing someone and seeing their auditions, you just little by little get to know them. Of course, when theater was going, I was a real theater goer. And I would see people in theater. I would see people in other commercials, in film. Agents would ask me to meet someone. That's how. By living, by living, <laughs> by living and being involved with and doing what you do as an actor, somehow someone sees you. If I'm not seeing you, someone else is. If I don't have you something for you in a year and you're with an agent, other people are having opportunities for you. I love it. So inspirational. <laughs> Good. So I took your workshop a few months ago, and I've actually talked about it before on the podcast because I love oh. it. <laughs> and I recommend everyone to take it. It's amazing. And I've learned so much. And Terry also does commercial and voiceover. Yes. Um, I did her commercial. Um, I'd love to do the voiceover, too, because I have this fancy mic. But <laughs> You're ahead of the game. I am. <laughs> so when I took your workshop a few months ago, you talked a little bit about how an actor and a casting director go through the same thing in a sense. So for actors, we're hearing back from casting. But for you, it's hearing back from the director. And Yes. My producer is the liaison between the ad agency the final client and me. Oh, when they need me, you know, the emails will come anytime at night. And then when they're done with me, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's crickets. If I have to ask them something, sometimes, <laughs> you know, they're busy doing what they're doing. And we go through the same thing as talent where 
you have to be very, very flexible. You have to expect the unexpected. You have to be put at a disadvantage. You have to be good at improv so you can think fast on your feet. So do we. (laughs) Not that we are acting improv, but we have to think fast on our feet all the time. We are given, we're thrown curveballs all the time. Things are changed on us all the time. And that's just how it works. You know, I've been in this for so long. That does not get me surprised. It doesn't get me annoyed. It definitely puts pressure on me. And every time I accept a job, there's a responsibility that comes along with it that I'm going to come through. There's no dress rehearsal for this. They tell me a date that the casting session is. And then I have to bring that casting session in on that date and nail it on that date. Just like actors, you show up at at your audition and that's it. You have to perform well. We're all only as good as our last job. That, you know, that's similar to, like I said, all the changes. We could get instructions in the morning of the casting session where they say, we're changing a role, or we're changing an age of a role, or we're adding a role, or we're taking away a role. And so we have to quickly change (laughs) and get a new breakdown out and get people in later that day and try to cancel as many people who we already gave appointments to. So those are a whole bunch of similarities that we all go through. Oh, here's the biggest similarity. There's ups and downs. And the biggest similarity is plan to go away for a vacation day and you will get a job. (laughs) (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) I always think that's so interesting, like what you said has stuck with me, because I feel like there's just this whole thing about gatekeepers and how casting are the gatekeepers and get to know them because those are the gatekeepers. (laughs) What's interesting is that you guys also have someone that you need to please too, and it's kind of just like a big wheel of everyone just wanting the best for this project and looking up to the person who has the final decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. And guess what? Our producers work for someone too. They have people above them and they have pressure and they have to come through. And directors, they have reps. They they belong to a production company that reps them and they have to come through and they're dealing with very big budgets. They have to come in on time. All the years I've been doing this, I think it's absolutely fascinating. They're so good at what they do where they can see one audition of you that's a couple of minutes and then meet you either in person or now via Zoom for five minutes, direct you here and there, stretch you out a little bit, and then they can figure out who they're going to book And there's so much depending on each actor to fulfill that role because if they're shooting a $500,000, $800,000 commercial or even a million dollars and they've only met their actors really for a couple of minutes and they just can tell and they trust that the actor is going to come through for them. I actually think actors have a lot of pressure on them. That would scare me. <laughs> <laughs> it is scary. Actors are so brave. Oh, well, thank you. It's a big responsibility. <laughs> it is, but we think that what you do is amazing too. So it works out. <laughs> <laughs> So, as I said, you have an amazing workshop. So, how did you get into teaching? Actually, a very long time ago in New York City, I had a friend who was an actor, theatrical, taking theatrical class, studying, ongoing. And I remember she came up to me one day and said, Would you teach us how to act in a commercial? And I said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know how to do that. (laughs) And she said, 
I have five people, you know, gathered and please, you know, teach us. And so I did. And it was for three weeks and it wasn't enough. So I extended it and people started booking. And then, of course, as anything, as in anything, you know, when you do it enough, you evolve. I have evolved. It, <laughs> now it has evolved really into, I call it commercial acting workshop because it's based on fundamental actings in a short scene format. And I compare commercials to a short scene. And there are certainly differences and there are similarities between commercials and theatrical. When I say commercial, uh, theatrical, I'm referring to theater and film right now. And I just throughout the years was very good at eyeing what was going on and figuring out and being able to put it into words what was working and why it was working and what wasn't working and why something in a performance wasn't working. So I love it. I could be casting all day long and under so much stress, stress and pressure. And then that evening I can go into a workshop and teach and the stress and the pressure just leaves me because it's just, it's getting into another zone and there's no stress, no pressure. And it's just so creative to see actors work and see them change. It's just full of joy. I just, I want to tell everyone that you're truly like a rock star because we would, the class is like, it's a pretty long class too. And three hours five weeks and you have different classes too going on while I was in that class and you had emails coming in and you'd have to check your phone sometimes because you had so much going on that was with casting the producers you know we have a deadline and we have to meet that deadline so the emails and the calls come in all through the night agents go through the same thing if our client does not give us that breakdown till, for instance, three o'clock in the afternoon, and it takes us two hours to put it together and get it out, so that's five o'clock already. The agents get it at five, and they get tons and tons and tons of them. Then they have to get it out, figure it out, and get it out to their clients. So <clears throat> they have to work late. Then if it's for the next day or even the day after, we need our confirms. So, you know, agents are working throughout the night getting confirms from their talent and then getting those confirms back to us. It just kills me that I can't tell you how many actors don't confirm quickly. We start emailing and texting the agents starting at three o'clock in the afternoon because we have a session the next morning and we don't have this one or that one confirmed. We cannot have big time gaps in our casting sessions. We have to come through with a nice full casting session because there's no other day to have it. There's not the budget to say, okay, you didn't bring in the, enough people today. Why don't you go again tomorrow? It just doesn't work that way. So actors really responding to the texts that they get with the breakdowns and getting right back to their agents. I can't tell you how many times it's I get, oh, I thought I confirmed. Oh, I was going to confirm later. It's like, okay. And then we would lose a spot and we put that out to another actor and another actor is losing a job. Everything's connected. I actually had an agent text me one morning last week. What do you teach your actors? And I called him. This was an early morning text. Oh, no. Like at 8 a.m. And I called him and I said, I don't understand your text. <laughs> nice hearing from you so early in the morning, but I don't understand. <laughs> well, 
we signed an actor that took your commercial workshop. What do you teach them? I said, what do you mean? What do I teach them? You know what I teach. He's not answering our calls. He's not showing up. He's not answering our calls to tell us whether he's available or not. Do you teach them that they're supposed to <laughs> answer us right away and work with their agent? I said, I wouldn't even dream that I would have to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> you shouldn't have to say that. I know. But it's a great example of how relationship driven this business is. The actor wasn't acting professionally. My name was on the resume mm -hmm. for a class they took. Terry, what do you teach them? Why isn't this actor showing up? <laughs> That's crazy. But to deal with all that and still do the classes, you are a rock star. <laughs> of course. Going back to how you teach, what's the first thing you think an actor should do when they get commercial copy? Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, along with the copy, this is really important. Because now, with all the self-tapes, actors are a part of our organizational process. So we're depending, we're depending on you. So if it's not the very first thing, you know, first read it over, read over what, who you are, what you're doing. Definitely analyze the piece of copy. If it's copy, who are you? Where are you? You know, go through the whole analytical part of making your choices. When you send that in, you must, must follow the directions that we're, we've given you to the T. And I'm not saying that to be uh, harsh or a control freak, but first of all, we've had to look at you know, 600, 700, thousands of pictures, resumes, 4,000 it could be, and reels, some reels. So when, when we invite you then to actually uh, self-tape and send in your reel, there's specific directions of how to frame yourself Definitely by this time, and if you don't have the proper lighting or background, you should definitely find out how to do that <laughs> and get that straightened out. But also slate your name. Do not slate an agent. Slate your name, take one. Don't slate your name on the second take. Say take two. When you send it in, label it. First name, last name, space, role, name. Because that is what we have to do. That's how we're organizing it before we send it out to our clients. So we, there's a whole other person who's there organizing everything, part of our team. This happens with voiceover too. Just say that your sound is crummy and really bad and i can i can sort of tell through that sound that you were that you're good but just the way you sent it in is not good at all we'll put that aside and say okay you know i have to get in touch with that person and tell them to do it in a different way most of the time there's no time for that and then the other <laughs> thing is that there are so many, so many, so many good ones that we've put that aside to get to, but we won't ever get to it because there's so many good ones. So psychologically, what happens is you just drop off. You drop off the radar because there's just so many good ones. So taking direction is really, really, really important. So What's the main difference between a commercial audition and a theatrical audition? Well, the main difference is there's a camera in both. And the big main difference is for theatrically, you never look into that camera. You don't relate to that camera. It's a fly on the wall. They use it 
to afterwards to review, to remind them and, you know, really watch and watch and watch and remind. And they do that commercially too, but theatrically, the cameras will fly on the wall. You do not pay attention to that camera. Commercially, unless they tell you not to, or if you're in an improv scene, looking out at something else or with another person, when it's one person speaking, you look right into the eye of that camera. The, that camera is another relationship in the scene. So that's the big, huge main difference. When I had my first commercial audition, I was like, that was something that I was like, whoa, because I hadn't taken any classes yet. And they were like, look in there. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, like deer in headlights. I guess it could be a little scary and intimidating because theatrically, you know, you're not supposed to do that. That's why you yeah. need to take your workshop. <laughs> it's amazing. The bookings, the avails, the agent signings. It's very, 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 very exciting for me because in my role in teaching is to help you reach your goals. So that's the main thing that I want. And it's, it's been happening. So I'm very satisfied with it. Very, very, it, it's, it's very satisfying, gratifying. And I know how appreciative the talent are the actors are so that's great it is great so here's the last question i always ask everyone this one last what would you have told yourself when you were starting out it's gonna be okay <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how to answer that one it's a tough one it's not gonna come out right i think that it's gonna be okay like you said it's a great answer i really do <laughs> well thank you so much terry thank you you're so easy to talk to oh, i try really you have a nice voice too thank you maybe i'll do the voiceover class <laughs> so joyful oh, thank you well i love doing these it's so fun and like talking to you is so fun like I never knew your story I, I loved your class but I never knew where you came from you know <laughs> thanks for listening if you enjoyed the episode feel free to follow the podcast on Instagram at Sage May Speaks and be sure to give a rate on whatever platform you're listening on I can't wait to see you next season <laughs> <laughs>